Hello, my name is Ricky Newport, and I'm a former professor of history at Indiana University and a historian of the Bremer area. 2007 marks the 120th anniversary of our town. And to commemorate this milestone, the students in the Bremer High School Business Department set forth to tell the story of our hometown. As we began discussing this documentary film project, many ideas about how to present Bremer's story developed. It soon became evident that the best way to tell this story was through the voices of the many who have called Bremer home. In other words, the stories from Bremer's current and former residents would collectively become the story that we wanted to share. This film, you might say, is not as much a history lesson as it is a conversation about the place that we call home and how, over its 120 years of existence, much has changed. But essentially, Bramer is still the biggest little town in Missouri. Hello, my name is Kara Johnson. I'm Quinn Brown. And I'm Zach Ewell. And on behalf of the Bramer Entrepreneurship Class of 2007, we proudly welcome you to enjoy the following film. It has been a wonderful experience getting to know the many people that we've interviewed during the making of this documentary film. And we hope that it brings a smile to your face as you relive some of your own memories of growing up in Bramer. It all started with the decision of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railway Company to extend their line from Ottumwa, Iowa to Kansas City, Missouri in the fall of 1885. By the winter of 1886, the entire route had been surveyed and the right-of-way had been settled for a reported $7 million. Local legend has it Daniel Bramer gave the railroad the right-of-way through his extensive land holdings, as did numerous others in this area. To develop customers, the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul either passed through existing towns or established new ones. In determining a site for Bramer, a problem developed. Some of the landowners in the area didn't want to sell their land to the railroad. Unable to build where they wanted, building commenced alongside the right-of-way on the north side of present-day N Highway, about a half mile east of the Four Corners at Bramer's north edge. Eventually, the landowners were persuaded to sell the needed land and Bramer was established as it is now. To help pay for the railroad construction, lots were sold by the Milwaukee Land Company, an affiliate of the Chicago Milwaukee Railway Company. Daniel Bramer was named an agent for the land company and assisted in selling area lots. Mr. Bramer's help to the railroad resulted in the land company naming the town after him. Bramer soon became one of the busiest stations along the Milwaukee line between Ottumwa and Kansas City. As Bramer's importance to the Milwaukee line grew, so did the opportunities for new businesses in the town. But no town in the earliest stages of development could have real aspirations of growth without financial resources. Thus, the Bank of Bramer was established in the first permanent business building to be erected in the town in 1887. Banking business commenced on November 19, 1887, in the building that has become known simply as the Farrar Building.
Perhaps one of the earliest known contractors in the area of the new town of Bramer was Mr. Wesley Layton, known throughout the region for the finest bricklayer and plaster work that money could buy. He was assisted by his sons, Fred and Charlie, and the Layton's work can still be seen uptown in some of the early buildings of Bramer, monuments to the fine skills of these gentlemen. Of the early businesses established in Bramer, none have lasted longer or impacted the community more significantly than the Bramer Bee. Established on July 8, 1887, the Bee has evolved into one of the most consistent pillars of the Bramer community. The name of Bramer's source for weekly news comes from its early motto, straightforward as the flight of a bee. Even after 120 years of service, and despite the instant information and communication we have today, folks still rush to get their weekly copy of the bee when it hits the newsstands. Of course, if you receive your bee by mail, you have to wait an extra day, by which time your neighbor may know the difference between hot gossip and the straightforward truth. An excerpt from the 1987 Bramer Centennial book may have said it best. Love and respect goes out to the publishers of the Bramer Bee. Its existence has been more valuable to our town than words can ever express. It was through their efforts that a notice of our birth was published, our school accomplishments recognized, and marriages announced. About the Bramer Bee, they said everybody in town knew what everybody was doing, and the only reason they subscribed to the Bramer Bee was to see if anybody had been caught. Although the Bramer Bee has been our community's number one source for news for many, many years, for a time it had to compete for Bramer's news readers. In April of 1891, the Bramer Comet hit the newsstands for the first time. Citizens of the Bramer area now had an alternative for news and political views. The Comet was regarded as a Republican Party-influenced publication and, according to some, was the first newspaper in the United States to endorse Theodore Roosevelt's bid for the presidency in 1904. Another business established in 1887, Bramer's very first year of existence, was the Farrar Insurance Agency, which opened an office in the town's first building, the Bank of Bramer. The business was owned by S.F. Farrar Sr., who remained active from 1887 until 1947. His son, D. Irving Farrar, was active in the business from 1911 until 1972. Robert K. Farrar, seen here in a 1992 interview, joined the insurance firm in 1954 and remained active into the late 1980s. Sadly, the audio from this interview was not able to be salvaged for this film. Mr. Farrar passed away in June of 1999, and Bramer had lost one of its greatest voices for stories and memories of the town's past. Robert Farrar is seen here with Thomas Anderson, Bramer's current school superintendent, and a representative of the Not Not Agency at the time of the merger in 1985. We didn't necessarily set out to teach a history lesson, but we believed it was important to discuss just how Bramer came to be. It is truly through the voices of Bramer residents past and present that we can best tell the story that we set out to share. Whenever we come into town on Saturday night, as a general rule, though, uh, we didn't come to town every Saturday night. Uh, whenever you came to town, you uh, had uh, you brought your eggs and your cream, uh, and you sold it. And uh, once in a while, if you had some chickens or something like that, you could bring them to town. Uh, back then, when I was growing up, we didn't have 
very much money at the time. And whenever we uh, did get something, why well, was you had to trade something else for it. Then after I did that, I worked at Pie's store in Bremer, which was a general store right down here where, well, where they tore it down. I was more of a bookkeeper. They had they brought people brought produce in, eggs and cream and stuff, and tested them and then brought the ticket to me. And I made out the check and sit around, visit in. Uh... Tommy's or Wiles Cafe, or like my dad used to take me to Barron's uh, Tavern while mom was buying groceries and he would uh, get me an orange pop to drink. So we had quite a bit going on. If you wanted to see anything, you went to school to the basketball games, the football games, or whatever. It was about the only entertainment we had. We did have a theater. Uh, we did have a nice theater, and uh, I think it cost a dime to get in, and a nickel on Thursday night was half price. One of the most successful early family businesses in Bramer was the general store and merchandising company of Dr. W.H. Pye and family. Dr. Pye came to Bramer in 1899 and opened his first store location. And even after his death in 1923, the business carried on under the direction of the Pye family. The store later moved to the east side of Main Street in 1930, and it continued to carry a variety of retail items, including the latest fashions of the times. The Pye family and their business became a centerpiece of early Bramer commerce. probably 10 or 11 years old and just tall enough to they had their stuff it was flat and on the shelves you know and had little glass thing markers between everything and uh, just looking at that big girl stuff you know wishing that I was big enough to, to have some of that stuff <laughs> but yeah they had uh, they had everything and I worked at high store and then my folks were late too and you just got you were so tired but people waited the last minute to come back and pick up their groceries before they went home and it was sometime it's midnight before we'd get home although pies was considered a centerpiece in early bramer commerce it was not alone in the general merchandising business early on the farmer's store, later known as Dalby's, became an important part of the Bramer economy. Opened for business by James Dalby in 1892, Dalby's became a household word around Bramer for its complete inventory of general merchandise. Dalby's was also known for the fine furnishings within the store and for the kindness shown to its patrons in the toughest of times during the Great Depression. Oh, I'll tell you, it was our, our really fine store. And it was on the corner where Tim Foley's station is now. It was a big two-story building, brick building. And in the bottom of that building, it, had, it was quite large, but it was wonderful. And they had a, a high desk in the back. And that was the first I ever saw where you would send your money from the clerk up to the cashier. And they would... Uh, make the change and send it back. But that was a wonderful store. It had uh, stools and you would sit to make your selections. And then on the other side were men's apparel and then in the back was, was grocery, groceries. It was really, you know, special. And, but they allowed credit. And it was a time when times were so hard and they were so soft-hearted, they just kept giving people credit. Then they couldn't get their money, and they had to close. That was really, that was a big event in Bremer, it truly was. Dalby's closed in 1931 after years of service to Bremer. Eight years later, on August 23, 1939, the former Dalby building was destroyed by fire. The building at the time housed B.H. Griffin & Sons implement business, along with Dr. H.H. H. Patterson's practice. The fire also damaged other businesses including Lanters Lumber Company, the Standard Station of O.R. Rice, and the John Hargrave Building. The fire was so intense that buildings across the street also burned, 
including the Nevitt Building, which housed Schindler's Cafe, and the practice of Dr. J.R. Crank. Also touched by the fire was Dolph Ford's Cafe, Amory's Produce, Marker's Barbershop, Dorsey Telephone Company, and George Smith's Harness Shop. Despite fires and other setbacks, the town of Bramer and local business and trade continued to grow around the Milwaukee Railroad. By the close of the 1800s, Bramer was served by three passenger and eight freight trains each way along the Chicago-Milwaukee line. Additional livestock trains were utilized as demand dictated. These numbers would continue well into the 1930s. A popular Chillicothe to Kansas City local passenger train became known affectionately as the Dude and later the Doodlebug. The Dude was often used by those wanting to spend the day in Kansas City for shopping. This 1907 ticket stub shows the rate of 61 cents for a passenger to travel from Chillicothe to Bramer along the Chicago-Milwaukee line. Bramer's depots became social and commercial centerpieces of the community throughout the early years. Folks would gather at the depot to socialize and check out who was coming in or going out on the train. Of an evening, we would go down, when, get one of the young people, we'd go down to the depot and watch the trains come in, see who got on and who got off. And it was <laughs> fun. Over the years, a growing trucking industry whittled away at the railroad freight business, while automobiles did the same for passenger travel along the Milwaukee Railway. In 1958, the Milwaukee discontinued passenger traffic. Bramer's final main depot building eventually closed entirely in 1972 and sadly was torn down in 1980. A centerpiece of Bramer history was gone. Mrs. Maxine Farrar and her children Bill and Susan, along with Dan and Sally Stratton, boarded the final passenger train heading west from Bramer in April of 1958 and rode to Excelsior Springs. Mrs. Lauren L. Stratton picked them up at the train station and drove them home by car. Perhaps a symbolic moment that represented the changing of the times. The development of more efficient transportation had profound effects on small communities and Bramer was no exception. As the automobile began to evolve, it became a vital link between small communities and major ports and cities. Cars and trucks became more and more affordable over time, and gradually more people had the means to travel to the city to look for work and to purchase goods and services that, before, they would find in Bramer. As faster and more efficient means of transportation developed, the role of the small town in our country began slowly changing. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, during the period of Bramer's development, small towns were self-sufficient economic centers of the rural countryside. People traveled to Bramer from surrounding areas and communities to trade produce, purchase products and services, and for socializing and entertainment. Saturday nights in Bramer held something for everyone. Because I rode the bus, so we, I didn't, didn't get to come to town after school. And I was just talking the other night about how I remember when I would come on a Saturday evening, first we had to watch with my grandmother, Nick B. We had to watch the Lawrence Welk show <laughs> on TV. And then we came to town, and I'm not sure what the restaurant was at that time, but I think it was Wilds. Does that sound right? And that's we would eat our supper then at Wilds. I do remember lots and lots of traffic, cars, and the U-turn at each end of Main Street. <laughs> but uh, of course later they had that was when I was a little little girl. But uh, in later years it was theater and just shopping. That was it. Everybody visiting. 
of Nelm Street. But you knew at that time you knew everybody and everybody knew you and it was really uh, great. You had no fear of anything and, and you could just go to town and buy your ice cream cones and wander around if you wanted to and that was great and uh, that's what was so special about a small town. Coming to town on Saturday night was a uh, uh, kind of a privilege because uh, you waited until uh, the, the last part of the week because you knew that Saturday night you were going to come in town and see all your friends, people uh, that you hadn't seen for quite a while, maybe one, two weeks. Uh, and it's just a, it was just a getting together of uh, uh, community. Oh, I remember them so well, yes. We all went to town. And, and we just sit in garage and watch people walk up and down the street if we weren't doing that ourselves. One thing I remember about Saturday nights, I worked in the cafe when I was older. And the boys and girls would come in after the show. And at that time the show would cost plenty to go. And the girls would say, I'll have a Coke. And the boys would say, I'd have a Coke. Then they'd take the girl, you don't need to do this. Then they would take the girls home and come back and eat. <laughs> But it was depression times. It was, it was the way you did it. Well, usually on Saturday afternoons, uh, uh, the crowd would be so large uh, in town that uh, if you wanted to park a car uh, in a good spot downtown to see people going by and meet people, uh, you had to get the car down there uh, probably by 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Otherwise, if you waited till later, why uh, all the parking spaces would be taken care of. Us. So it'd be several times that I'd take my car and and park the car downtown early, four o'clock in the afternoon, and go home and come back downtown later in the evening when they enjoy the the uh, <coughs> uh, crowds and the people that come to town. Saturday night. <laughs> was our big night to go to the movies. That was in 1939, 40. And uh, usually had a date, of course. <laughs> and uh, then afterwards, we'd just walk us home because we had no car. <laughs> Everybody dressed up just like they was going to go to church. And the people, a lot of people, brought their car to town early put it on Main Street so they could watch the people go up and down the street. And I uh, what I remember was most of the time it would have been Robert, Colin, and I up at the basketball courts just playing because we had nothing else to do. But occasionally there, there was a lot of people that would go to the car wash or the dugout and people would just hang out and the bowling alley was closed. There was really nothing other than the bowling alley here to do. so. We'd either we'd be up the basketball courts, or we would be the dugout, or the car wash. Like I said, just hanging out with as many people as we could get to stop in and hang out with us. There's a lot of things for people to do, and when on Saturdays was a big day in Bramer. Many people came to town to buy groceries. Obviously, on Saturday night was a big thing for teenagers to drive the main drag where we went down from uh, the old hotel, sat down there where Clops is now. We made the U-turn and went back up the street and made a U-turn at the end of the end of Maine and came back down. Sometimes if you had enough gas, you went all the way over the bowling alley and came back uptown. Transferred to Bramer in 1941 by Mattingly Brothers to run their five and dime store, Tommy and Martha Jefferson quickly became familiar faces around Bramer. Tommy remembers Saturday nights from a businessman standpoint. I mean, we had two Saturdays. We had Fridays, which were sale day, of the community sale day, the farmer's auction of uh, livestock and so forth. And that brought all, all the people to Bremer on Friday. And then Saturday, they came back on Saturday because that was the day that you uh, 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 accumulated in Bremer. The Jeffersons later opened a cafe in 1947 which operated on the west side of Main Street and became a favorite hangout of the younger generations. In 1968, Tommy opened a drive-in on the east side of North Main Street. 
The Jeffersons would continue to run the cafe until 1971. Tommy's drive-in would continue until 1978. Martha remembers Tommy's offered so much more than just hamburgers and milkshakes. Or drink, and then there's Tommy's Cafe and uh, Perkins' Cafe used to have the, uh, a place to dance. People used to go dance. And... It's amazing to go to town on Saturday now of an afternoon. No, not hardly any cars are on the street then. And of course, you're not hardly at night. Yeah. But that was a big night, Saturday night in Bremer. The Second World War deeply affected the Bremer community as it did our entire country. Countless families from our area sent loved ones to fight in the biggest war our world has ever known. For those left behind, sacrifices were made on the home front in support of the war effort. Rationing of food, rubber, metals, gasoline, and other resources forced changes in daily life of those back home. Bramer wasted little time in lending a hand to the war effort. In the fall of 1942, the community rallied together for a one-day scrap metal drive that produced 215 tons of metal. This total surpassed that of the entire Livingston County collection effort by eight ton. Herbert Wooden, who was interviewed by the Bramer Bee during a layover at the depot, remarked that there was no other town that he knew of that did things so thoroughly as does Bramer. During his travels along the Milwaukee line, he saw many scrap metal piles collected by other communities, but nothing touched the results found in Bramer. The war truly hit home in the Bramer area in alarming fashion at approximately 7.33 a.m. on February 19, 1943, when an American B-17 bomber returning to its home base in Kearney, Nebraska, crash-landed after running out of fuel in heavy fog. This was near the home of Mr. Willis Sneed, who lived just south of the Twin Bridges, about two miles south of Bramer on A Highway. Bramer area native Bill Pollard, a student at Cowgill School in 1943, remembers the crash landing. They were down in, uh, in Florida on, I guess this was sort of a maneuver run maybe, and uh, they left and they were headed back to their, their home airport in Kearney, Nebraska. <coughs> and this, so anyway, the, uh, the fog was really bad for them and and at one time, uh, they were within not too many miles of, of the airport in Kearney. And uh, so they were ordered to fly toward Kansas City and get away from the fog, but they couldn't do that. And uh, of course, they kept getting low on fuel, and they seen that they were real low on fuel. So when they got in the Bremer area here, they, there was a little break in the fog. So they, they spotted the highway, the road down south here, you know before they finally crash landed. A highway. Yeah, this was in uh, February, I think the 19th, 1943. I was in Calgill High School and our principal, uh, Ren Foster, he, uh, he got word by telephone, of course, that, that the plane had crashed down there. And he says, I'll take a load down. So we all, a certain amount of us boys loaded in his 1936 Chevrolet and, and we buzzed down there. And uh, we noticed that uh, one of the crew was, was guarding the plane. And we later found out it was due to the, the secrecy of the bomb site. This bomb site has a special name, but I can't tell you what it is right now. But you, you can uh, look it up probably. So anyway, uh, I, I, I also uh, 
like I said, my, uh, my, my little, one of my brothers is in the eighth grade. His teacher, uh, uh, Mrs. Jack Wilkerson, she wasn't married at the time. So uh, she took a snapshot and uh, gave it to my brother, but I finally captured that, and that's where I got my picture. The sacrifices and heroism on the front lines in Europe and the Pacific also hit home. Several young men from the Bremer area made the ultimate sacrifice for their country and the freedom of the entire world. That's, uh, American Legion's named Tweedy Murray after my brothers. Both of them were killed. Bramer went on to further honor the Murray brothers, along with other fallen soldiers, by naming streets in the town in their honor. The technological innovations of the early 20th century began changing the dynamics of American life. Beginning early on with the telephone and radio, technology began to change the way people communicated with one another and how they sought entertainment. The growing popularity of television in the 1940s and early 1950s dramatically changed the social landscape in small towns. Bramer, as with other communities, would slowly see a decline in the flood of town goers over the weekend. And one of the first ones in town brought it from Sam Amory. And my grandmother would come up, and she lived in the same house where your grandparents lived. And she'd look at that television, and she just could not imagine where that was coming from. <laughs> and then people used to visit each other so much at night. Country people, you know, would go visiting. After when television came in, it just seemed like everything changed. People stayed home. They didn't go visit anybody that had one for fear they wanted to watch it. Program. The old saying yeah. is that just sat in front of the two, and that had a big effect on the uh, uh, this little town of Bremer mm -hmm. because we didn't socialize as much, and people stayed more at home. But before television, if you gathered at different people's houses and visited with each other. We think right now of our media, uh, our telephones, uh, our television, the radio. I mean, now now it's commonplace, and as a matter of fact, you might say a little bit passe. Uh, but back then, if you had a small radio, whether it be compact or a console, you were really uptown. I mean, you you was uh, you was in the know. In a small town like Bramer, nothing is more central to the community than the school system. Bramer has a proud tradition of excellent schools, beginning with the very first school, a four-room frame building built in the new town of Bramer in 1888 at the corner of present-day 3rd Street and Murray Avenue. Mr. Fred Eby made his place in history by becoming the very first graduate of Bramer High School in 1893. As Bramer entered the 1900s, enrollment grew steadily and a new brick school building was built in 1903. The new building quickly became a centerpiece of Bramer activity. A new high school building was added in 1921 next to the 1903 structure, which was then used to house elementary classes. 
A story about growing up during the Great Depression written by Miss Vera Repine tells of her experiences as a student of Bramer High. Although the American Depression officially began with the stock market crash in 1929, not too many living in Bramer were directly affected. Actually, many were already in difficult circumstances and had been for some time. Rural students paid tuition to come to Bramer High School, the fee being $5 per month. I kept the library for my tuition, which meant I had no study time at school and had to take all lessons home. As there were no buses at that time, we rode horseback to school and delivered milk at 10 cents a quart before school. Our senior trip was a picnic in the park at Excelsior Springs. I remember my dad gave me a half dollar for spending money that day. I didn't go swimming as I was afraid to rent a suit for fear I might need the money for supper in case we stayed late. Miss Vera Repine, Bramer High School. Both of these buildings were destroyed by fire on March 29, 1949. This proved to be a major turning point for the Bramer School District. Prior to this time, many rural schoolhouses, mostly being one-room structures, covered the surrounding areas. Over 20 smaller districts were included in the three counties of Caldwell, Carroll, and Ray around Bramer. One of these schools was Tobin Valley School which sat northwest of Bramer and has since been relocated to the southern part of town near the current school building. Another of these schools was Plymouth in Carroll County, which is still used as a community center. A solution to the sudden need for a school building in Bramer following the fire of 1949 was consolidation of the many surrounding country schools. A special election on September 20th, 1949 would pave the way for the consolidated school district of Bramer C4. The vote carried 743 to 324 to borrow money and issue bonds in the amount of $209,000 to begin construction. C4 School District dedicated its new building on September 4, 1955. Over the years, many renovations have been completed to the complex, 
including brand new windows for the entire school in the fall of 2007 under the administration of new superintendent Tom Anderson, a 1966 graduate of Bramer High School. Throughout the history of the biggest little town in Missouri and the developments of various technologies over the years, area residents have looked for and found ways to entertain themselves and enjoy the small town life. At the forefront of Bramer Entertainment is the love for sporting events and various other school and community activities. Whether it be the Bramer Invitational Basketball Tournament, one of the state's longest running sporting events, an evening of summer baseball, the lights of Friday night football, or dancing and singing at a concert featuring local musicians and other area talent. Bramer has always found a way to keep itself cheering, laughing, and smiling. The spiritual center of any community lies within the church. Even before the town of Bramer was established in 1887, churches throughout the area provided a place for families to worship and grow both spiritually and socially. The Antioch Church of Christ was one of the earliest known congregations to meet in what is now Bramer. The first meetings were held in 1875 in a log cabin located on the northeast corner of the lots where the modern church building is located. A year later, the current building was completed. In 1899, 24 members became dissatisfied and left the congregation over a dispute over using piano music in services. The group officially separated from the church and formed the Bramer Christian Church, although for a time both groups shared the building alternating times. The piano was carried in for the Christian Church time slots and back out for Church of Christ services. The Christian Church then moved and officially dedicated its new building in 1901 at its current location.
The Bramer Baptist Church was first organized in 1882 as Pleasant Valley Baptist. A one-room structure was built in 1888 where the Baptist Church of today now stands, and the name was changed to the First Baptist Church of Bramer. At the time of Bramer's founding, there were four Methodist church organizations in the area, Black Oak, Elk Grove, Little Union, and Tatesville. The first established Methodist church building in Bramer was erected for $5,000 in 1890 at the site of the present-day parsonage. This building was partially destroyed by fire in 1903, but was restored and used until 1915 when the current building was completed and dedicated. The original cost of this building, including the lots, the pipe organ, and furnishings was $23,000, which was paid in full, and the church was dedicated free of debt. The St. Margaret Mary's Catholic Church of Bramer was started by Father John Mahoney, pastor of the Sacred Heart Churches of Hamilton and Utica, and was dedicated in 1953 by Monsignor George Parker. In previous years, masses were held in homes of the community. Bramer is the biggest little town in Missouri because Margie Amory used to say it was when we had a radio show in Bramer. Second reason is, if there was anything more to do in Bramer, we wouldn't have enough time to get it done. Bramer is the biggest little town in Missouri because apparently Margie Angry gave it that name when she was doing the Bramer News on KCHI Radio. But I have all often heard people say that when they come through Bramer, they're always surprised at how busy the downtown is, that it's always lined with cars and there's always people down here. They go to other little towns and there's nobody there. And also, Bramer has a big heart. So maybe that's why it's the biggest little town in Missouri. Bramer, biggest little town in Missouri. I'm not sure I remember anything correctly, but how I remember this story, or not a story, but I remember Ralph Goddard. It's the first person that would always either begin or end his radio broadcast with Bramer, the biggest little town in Missouri, and that is from the early 60s. And then, whenever he quit doing the local news, Margie Amy took over and continued to say it. But, where it originated from, I'm not sure, but I would have to guess it would be Ralph Goddard. Ralph Goddard gave Bramer the biggest little town, or called, first called it that, and then Margie Amory continued to use it on her um, radio news show. Back then, Bramer had many more businesses than it has now. You could get just about anything you wanted to in Bremer at that time. To me, it means that we've got a, a lot of good people with big hearts in Bremer. It seems like we all care about each other. Sometimes we know, maybe know each other's business a little bit more than uh, what we should, but I would still call Bremer the biggest little town in Missouri because of that. And we have a great school with a lot of good kids in it, and I'm very proud of it. Well, when I was only 12 years old, my family moved to Bramer. It was during the Depression years when there were no jobs, there were an awful lot of poverty among people. So as a young boy, I got a lot out of going to school every day and being with the Bramer children, kids. And we loved it. We played ball in the summertime, and uh, we just had a lot of good times, but uh, there wasn't a whole lot to do. In the 60s, Marge Amory was on the KCHI News, and she either opened or closed the news with, This is Marge Amory coming to you from Bramer, Missouri, the biggest little town in Missouri. We had uh, the bowling alley, three farm dealer implements, sold tractors, the jewelry store, the Western Auto, Gambles. Uh, the five and dime store, three grocery stores, two elevators, um, a drug store, a new car dealer. It was a uh, Hebner Chevrolet. We had two doctor's offices, a dentist office. P possibly the real reason was I think at that time in the 60s, if towns had a under a thousand in population, they were considered a town, not a city. 
and Bremer's population at one time was either 976, 986, or 996. And so we were, you know, that was kind of a cool slogan, the biggest little town in Missouri. Baptist preacher, First Baptist Church of Bremer, Reverend O.J. Bowles, uh, at a barber shop one day, named Bremer is the biggest little town in Missouri. Our fond memories. You know, we just, everybody just seemed to like each other and were there if you needed them. And yeah, I think it's just been a wonderful town to live in all your life. <laughs> I think of Bremer as being the biggest little town in Missouri because when you look at our population sign, our population says less than a thousand. So that makes us a little town. However, I think if you look at the businesses in town, you look at what our school has to offer, you look at what we as a community offer, that makes us a very large town. So I think that's where our biggest comes from. Another way of looking at it is what we have to offer. Not just do we have uh, business, but we have support from the whole community. We are one big family, and that makes us the biggest little town in Missouri. sign on a big old rusty tractor You can't miss it It's the first thing that you see Just up the road A pale blue water tower well, I love Jenny Painted in bright green Hey, that's my Uncle Bill there by the courthouse He'll be lowering the flag When the sun goes down and this is my time. Yeah, this is my town. Hey, where I was born, where I was raised, where I keep all my yesterdays. Where I ran off cause I got mad and it came to blows with my old man. When I came back, settled down, was where they put me in the ground. This is my town.
My name is Joe Mallory. <laughs> okay. Hello. My name is Joe Mallory, and I am the high school business teacher at Bramer C4 High School. 2007 marks the 120th anniversary of our town. They're not all falling over. No, you're standing in front of them, so it'll be all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. You're right. We go ahead and get that. We got your set. All right, start whenever. Hello, my name is Ricky Newport, and I am a Bramer area historian. 2007 marks the 120th anniversary of our town. Everybody's got a place they call home. For us, it's a small town just under a thousand people, in Northwest Missouri, where everybody seems to know everyone. And everyone seems to care. Bramer, and we welcome you there. The Bramer Bee, my Mr. Joe Mallory. One of the most constant staples of the Bramer community has long been the Bramer Bee. Our town sources for the hot news of the town of Bramer. Okay. Maybe somebody needs to be seen. Yeah, you are. <laughs> One of the most important consistent staples of the Bramer community has long been the Bramer Bee. Our town source for the hot news of the week. Established in July of 1887, the Bee shares a birthday with the town of Bramer. Colin Brown, left tackle, Bramer High School, playing for your Missouri Tigers. Are there any other words you'd like to say to help out um, your campaign? <laughs> <laughs> Vote for me for a woman president. Die! <laughs>